Just because a movie doesn't get a theatrical release doesn't automatically mean it's bad. Whether straight to streaming or straight to the bargain DVD bin, these films didn't get a chance to reach blockbuster status. As a muscular, pleasurable genre flick with a megastar at the center, Doug Liman's remake of Roadhouse could just as well have played in theaters instead of going straight to prime video. Indeed, that's what Liman himself expected. When his take on Roadhouse tentatively began development at MGM in 2021, the studio hadn't yet been bought by Amazon. Following the buyout, Roadhouse was developed as an Amazon MGM film and went on to bypass theaters, prompting a round of intense public drama. Lyman wrote an op-ed for Deadline voicing his dissatisfaction with the straight-to-streaming release, claiming that Amazon had left the possibility of theatrical distribution on the table if the film were good enough. Things were further complicated when sources told Variety that the filmmakers willingly opted for a streaming release in order to be granted a higher budget by Amazon. The truth remains unclear, but what is clear is that Amazon won that bout. Let's call this a draw. Uh, what the f is a draw? It's kind of like a win, man. Weird, the Al Yankovic story is an exaggerated send-up of music biopic cliches and turned into one of the biggest sensations of the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival. But despite Daniel Radcliffe's headline-grabbing central performance, the Roku channel, which produced and was set to distribute Weird from the beginning, was adamant about skipping theaters. But Weird Al, the subject of the film, really, really, really wanted to get a theatrical release. He told Yahoo Entertainment in October 2022, I've been begging, begging the Roku channel for months to make it Oscar eligible, which all that would involve is letting it play in a theater in LA for one week, but they've put their foot down. The ad-supported streamer instead preferred to focus its efforts on securing primetime Emmy eligibility. The strategy worked out well. Weird went on to win the Emmy for Outstanding Television Movie in a crowded field that also included Fire Island and Prey. Ah, a rising star. Pleased to meet you. Speaking of Fire Island, that film may be the best thing brought upon the world, albeit indirectly, by Quibi. The film began development as a 10-episode Quibi original series titled Trip. Cut to a year later, and the short-form streaming platform officially shut down, leaving the production of Trip up in the air. Thankfully, Searchlight Pictures acquired the project a few months later, and since it had always been conceived as a movie broken up into 10 parts, the script didn't take much retooling. The vote of confidence from Searchlight still wasn't enough to propel the movie, now retitled Fire Island, into theaters. But considering Quibi was originally the only place interested in a queer Asian rom-com full of hyper-specific inside jokes, even the film's ultimate Hulu release was a big win. Bong Joon-ho's Okja was among the first high-profile auteur films to be distributed by Netflix. Financed by the streamer itself with the aim of boosting Netflix's then-impending launch in South Korea, Okja premiered in competition at the 2017 Cannes Film Festival without much clarification on whether Netflix intended to ever put it in theaters, which prompted a rule change. It was eventually released straight to streaming, without commercial theatrical play anywhere in the world save for South Korea. Incidentally, the film's release in Bong's home country may offer a clue as to why Okja largely skipped theaters altogether. At the time, Netflix still insisted that its few theatrically distributed films must get day and date releases, opening simultaneously on Netflix and in theaters, which violated traditional theatrical windows of exclusivity, prompting the three largest theater chains in South Korea, which accounted for 93% of the country's screens, to refuse to screen Okja. A similar thing had happened two years earlier when Kerry Joji Fukunaga's Beasts of No Nation was boycotted in the US by the AMC, Regal, Cinemark, and Carmike chains. By the time Bong made Okja, Netflix may have calculated that an American theatrical release wasn't even worth trying for. Undisputed, a 2002 film about a superstar heavyweight boxer going up against the prison champion after being arrested is a minor entry in Walter Hill's filmography. Undisputed 2, Last Man Standing, and Undisputed 3, Redemption, however, are notable and well-loved among fans of martial arts cinema. It may seem ironic, considering that the first Undisputed was the one that got the chance to play in theaters, while its two sequels went straight to DVD. But it makes sense when you consider the original film's terrible commercial performance. If you don't join with us, you'll be destroying the unity we create. <laughs> Although a solid and worthwhile sports drama, Undisputed was not embraced by theatrical audiences. Its dismal gross of $14 million wasn't even enough to recoup its $20 million budget but it became a hit once it was released on DVD. 
maybe the home video market was always the right home for a lean, kinetic, dimly lit prison boxing flick. And sure enough, when Millennium Films went ahead with an MMA-themed sequel focused on Ving Rhames' character but replacing him with Michael Jai White, that was the market it was directly made for. Between 2017 and 2020, a lot changed in Hollywood, and Netflix films that would have once been forced into day-and-date releases started getting some time on the big screen before making their way to the streamer's catalog. Had things gone as planned, that would have been the case of Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, which was supposed to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival in May 2020 and then roll into American theaters in May and June. Like virtually everything in 2020, the film's release didn't go according to plan. Cannes 2020 was cancelled due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, and the planned theatrical bow of The Five Bloods was also cancelled. The film was instead released directly to Netflix worldwide. That didn't stop it from raking in awards come December and January of 2021. Delroy Lindo alone collected Best Actor prizes and nominations from over 50 associations, and Terrence Blanchard netted a Best Original Score Academy Award nomination. Drive is a 1997 sci-fi action film about a cybernetically enhanced man on the run from Chinese government agents and mercenaries trying to get their hands on his tech. It's the best-remembered film of Taiwanese makeup whiz turned director Steve Wang. Wang intended for the film to break new ground as a faithful Hollywood approximation of the unique rhythms of Hong Kong action cinema. But despite the high stature enjoyed by Drive among genre fans, it never got a theatrical release in the United States. The film had a complicated production history, and Wang took advantage of limited executive oversight to depart from the original plan of making a serious and straight-faced American-style actioner, incorporating more humor and exaggeration. Although producers loved the dailies during the shoot, the film was ultimately recut into a much shorter version for its theatrical release. Then, the theatrical release was scrapped altogether, and Drive instead premiered on HBO in June 1997, before making its way to DVD and VHS shelves in August. Decades later, Wang's vision would be vindicated. The director's cut of Drive, now a cult classic, got a 4K restoration and a Blu-ray re-release, in which the would-be theatrical cut was reduced to a little scene bonus feature. During the pandemic, it was inevitable that mainstream films had to find different distribution avenues from the standard wide theatrical release model. So when Disney made the decision to release Pixar's long-awaited Soul in select theaters and on Disney Plus simultaneously, it seemed like an entirely reasonable decision. Later in 2021, theaters started reopening, allowing Disney to release both Cruella and Raya and the Last Dragon theatrically. So, when Turning Red was entirely withheld from theaters in 2022, it became obvious that Disney was using Pixar's original films to beef up the Disney Plus catalog. Not only did that choice shock and sadden Pixar creatives who worked on Turning Red, but it also backfired. Later that same year, when Disney finally put a Pixar film back into theaters with Lightyear, the convoluted Toy Story spinoff bombed at the box office. Turning Red did eventually get to play in theaters in 2024, but there was no good reason it ever should have skipped them. Starring Laura Dern, the tale was a departure for director Jennifer Fox, whose previous feature films had all been documentaries. It was also one of the most acclaimed films of 2018, and yet it never got a theatrical release, instead following up its momentous Sundance premiere with an HBO acquisition. Fox actually had a very deliberate reason to opt for HBO instead of a traditional theatrical distributor. She wanted the film to get as wide an audience as possible. Indie distributors interested in picking up the film might not have been able to provide that, whereas HBO has always been in the business of starting national conversations. And that, the tale did. Amazon Studios was among the first players to get in on the changing Hollywood landscape of the post-streaming world. Unlike Netflix, however, they initially opted for a conservative approach to distribution. The first Amazon Studios films, including award winners like The Handmaiden, Manchester by the Sea, Cold War, The Big Sick, and many others, received fully traditional theatrical releases ahead of their prime video premieres. It wasn't until 2020's Troop Zero that Amazon started releasing films directly to prime video, and it's easy to see why the Burt and Birdie-directed Girl Scout dramedy was chosen as the trial subject for that new distribution model after being plucked from Sundance. Warm, touching, and featuring top-notch performances from Viola Davis and Allison Janney, the film is an ideal crowd-pleaser that immediately set a promising tone for what audiences could expect from full-blown Prime Video originals. Don't do nothing half-ass. I don't want to do anything with half an ass. No! As the critical stature of her 1975 drama Jean Dielman has risen dramatically and deservedly, Chantal Ackerman's most celebrated work has somewhat eclipsed the rest of her brilliant filmography. 
but anyone who's acquainted with Ackerman's non-Dealmon work will agree that her 1994 film, Portrait of a Young Girl at the End of the Sixties in Brussels, is one of her defining masterpieces. And yet, despite being a full 138 minutes shorter than Jean Dielman, Portrait didn't get to play theaters. In fairness, Portrait was originally developed as a TV movie, an entry in a nine-installment series of coming-of-age films from different directors titled All the Boys and Girls of Their Age. However, unlike other entries in the series, Portrait wasn't later expanded into a theatrical film. It seems wrong given how influential Ackerman's semi-autobiographical chronicle of a single day in a teen girl's life proved, with echoes in everything from Richard Linklater's Before trilogy to Joachim Trier's complete filmography. Before becoming arguably the defining master of ultra-naturalist working-class cinema, Mike Lee began his career in theater. When he moved from the stage to the soundstage and began directing and writing television plays for BBC in the 1970s, it was a natural evolution. Lee's filmed plays in this period are not as visually or formally dynamic as his later theatrical film work, but still brim with the curiosity of a great artist trying out a new medium. The first Mike Lee film to depart entirely from the television play format was 1983's Meantime, a trailblazing dramedy about London life in Margaret Thatcher's England, which had a healthy festival run, including screenings at the 1984 Barely Nala, but never played theaters commercially in the UK. What's the matter, Cully? You got your zip stack or something? Instead, it aired on Channel 4 as a TV movie, Lee's first collaboration with the network after a tenure of over 10 years at the BBC. 